Way up at the notepad. Hey y'all. Kind of glitching here. Uh, I got about um, three-ish minutes and we'll get started. So I uh, kind of wait for everybody to get settled and, and start getting on. Uh, about three minutes we'll be kicking off shortly. Be right back. My hot chocolate. This one. About two minutes. I'll show you real quick. These are some daisies for my granddaughter. Gave it to her grand today. How awesome is that? Be right back. Try to get this started here. Uh, it's kind of backwards with the self remove my Cafe de Mon, Cafe Olay, and Vanier's couple of hot chocolate here. So, <clears throat> so hello, y'all. Uh, I just hope everybody's having a beautiful, excellent day today and this beautiful Sunday. Um, uh, Father Mitchell say, Happy Lord's Day. Um, thank y'all for tuning in. Uh, I hope that uh, everything's going great in our lives today, and, and I know this quarantine thing is kind of tough on, on, on a lot of us, but um, we were able to make some drive-by deliveries of some goodies today to some uh, uh, to actually all three of our kids and grandkids. Um, I'm just looking forward to the day we can just hug them and kiss them with, with, with no problem again. You know, so uh, it's been pretty crazy, kind of freaky uh, that we have to do things. But um, anyway, um, let's start with. Um, just a, a, a opening prayer and, and some, some praise music. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Lord God, I just thank you for this beautiful day today. Thank you for your gift of our lives. Thank you for the gift of your life, for the gift of Jesus, and for the gift of your Holy Spirit, and for the gift of your Son, that him giving himself on a cross to suffer and die, to be buried and rise again on the third day to defeat death and to purchase our salvation with his blood. Just thank you, Lord God, for all those sacrifices. Pray, Lord God, that as I enter this time of prayer and praise tonight, that you'll anoint my heart, you'll anoint my voice, you'll anoint my body, my instrument, my equipment, that everything works properly here tonight, Lord God, and that you anoint the sound and the sights that happen here this evening. So every sound, every sight, Gives you glory and does your will. In Jesus' name, amen. 
St. Michael the Archangel, yeah. defend us in battle. Be our protection against the wickedness and snares of the devil. May God rebuke you, we humbly pray. And do thou, O Prince of the Heavenly Host, by the power of God, cast into hell Satan and all the evil spirits who prowl throughout the world, seeking ruin of souls. Amen. Amen. So uh, I'm going to start with um, it's a song by, uh, I have it by Jesus Culture. I'm not sure if they're the actual uh, originators of it or not. But um, it was a song called One Thing Remains. Um, if you, you may or may not know it, uh, if you do sing along with me. But either way, give it a uh, praise to me. Higher than the mountains that I face, stronger than the power of the grave, constant in the trial and the change. Yes, one thing remains your love. Your love never fails and never gives up and never runs out on me. Your love never fails and never gives up and never runs out on me. Your love never fails and never gives up and never runs out on me. Your love, your love. tells us that nothing can take us away from the love of God. That even though we separate ourselves in, in different ways, that when we be, be disobedient and be obstinate children like we can be sometimes, that no matter where we go with that, even when we run away, that he still loves us. We can, he cannot, we can never take his love from us. How awesome is that? Amen, amen. Um, I want to I wanna talk a little bit about uh, being a dangerous prayer warrior. The times we're in right now calls for you and I, the remnant church, to be dangerous. To be dangerous. Not physically dangerous like you're going to hurt your neighbor or your friend, but dangerous in faith. Dangerous as a prayer warrior. We're going to kind of get into that a little bit. I know exactly what that means. Um, first of all, before we get too much further... If you have any prayer requests, type them in the, uh, in the comment bar, the, re the reply bar, whatever you want to call it. I'm going to pray for all those requests later on this evening. Uh, even if you, you don't want to type them, you want to just uh, speak them out loud to yourself, in your heart, whatever, we're going to pray for all the prayer requests before we finish tonight. I'm going to try to be less than an hour. Uh, I'm going to get done. I'd like to, um, to invite you to go to my dear friend, uh, Terry Lobel. Uh, it's Terry Pastor T. Lobel is the name of his page. Uh, he's doing a... Um, like a, a little revival uh, sort of video tonight. He's been doing lives every night between 8 and 9. Tonight is at 8. 
So hopefully it get done before eight o'clock and uh, get y'all to tune in up to my, my dear friend, Terry Lovell, uh, Pastor T. Awesome man of God. Awesome man of God. So anyway, um, I've been beating this to death. I'm going to keep on beating it. It's not a dead horse. This is a, this is a live horse. This is a, a, this is a living word of God truth. So I say I'm beating it to death. It's not that I'm just running over, over and over something to make it redundant. It's just something to keep reminding us of. In 2 Chronicles 7, 14, Scripture tells us, And if my people who are called by my name humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their evil ways, I will hear them from heaven, pardon their sins, and heal their land. Say it again. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my presence and turn from their evil ways, I will hear them from heaven, pardon their sins, and heal their land. Some verses say, seek my presence. Some verses say, seek my face. Excuse me. But again, if you haven't heard me say this the last 307 times, uh, you know, to humbly seek God's face, to humbly pray is to first admit to ourselves and openly admit to God that we understand that we're not self-sufficient, that we understand that we need him, and there's nothing we can do alone. Because without God's help, without God's love and mercy, we're done for. So, Lord God, I come to you, your child, among many children, and I pray that all of you watching and all of you who will see this later you know, as a recording, um, that you join me in humbly seeking God's face. To seek his face, to seek his wisdom and his mercy to help us in these trying times. Not just to get through this coronavirus mess, but to help us in the days to come so that we can be brought closer to him, to be strengthened, to have his mercy and his love, so that we're ready for anything that comes our way. Because you know as well as I do, life isn't going to be any easier after this than it has ever been before. But with God's help, we can get through anything that life throws at us. Anything. So, you know, to, to understand, for us to humbly seek him in the pray. And for whatever we need. It doesn't have to be just for a specific situation. We can stand in the gap as the remnant church for the entire nation. Technically, literally for the whole world. But today, tonight, I'm talking about this nation. That we, the Renner Church, you and I, the believers, that we can stand in a gap and repent for the sins of our nation and our own sins, the sins of our community, the sins of our nations, and that God will hear our prayer. But Ivy, how can we do that? We don't even know people across the nation. You know, how can you repent for sins of people? That... We can stand in the gap. Just like when we ask people to pray for us, they're standing in the gap. When I ask somebody to pray for me if I'm ill or if I have a, uh, any kind of prayer request happening, if you type in prayer requests in here now or later, okay, we can each stand in the gap for each other. Because just like when my granddaughter was ill, she couldn't pray for herself because she was in a coma for almost a month. We stood in the gap. We stood in the gap for family and friends who didn't pray. We stood in the gap for those who couldn't pray. And I saw God produce miracles right in front of my face. God is so good. We can stand in the gap. And I'm going to read a few scriptures to you here that show you by the word of God that that is truth that we can pray for repentance for our nation and especially repentance for the church, not just the Catholic church, not just the Baptist church or Pentecostal or whatever it is, sign you have in your door, but for the church of God and the nation who have over the years become very complacent in our walk with God because it's, it's become to where, you know, uh, we're so politically correct in things that church becomes just another arm of just wanting to feel good. 
I'm not smashing or crashing or bashing anybody in particular, okay? Just <laughs> us as a church of God across the board, okay? We, we have become so numb at times to things around us that instead of stepping out and saying, hey, this is the right way to do that. Okay, we're straying off the path. Maybe we need to come back to here. You know, I'm as guilty as anybody is. I'm not just saying that, that my sin or your sin is better or, or better than the other, okay? Because we're all humans. We're all sinners, every single one of us. And we can all pray for each other. We can all stand in a gap for each other at all times. So I want to go to a couple of scriptures here. Um, where, uh, let me see, we'll get one of your first point here. We go to John, John 15, 5. Let me swing over to John 15, 5. Boom, boom, boom. Here we go. <clears throat> okay, John 15, 5. Um, this is part of the vine and the branches discourse. I'm the vine, you're the branches, okay? Um, so, basically, I'm not going to read the whole entire thing, but... Um, Starting in, let's see, 15, let's start at, at 4, okay, verse 4. This is the NAB version. Remain in me as I remain in you. Just as a branch cannot bear fruit on its own unless it remains on the vine, so neither can you unless you remain in me. This is Jesus talking. I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever remains in me and I in him will bear much fruit. Because without me, you can do nothing. Jump down to seven. If you remain in me, and my words remain in you, ask for whatever you want, and it will be done for you. By this is my Father glorified, that you bear much fruit and become my disciples. As the Father loves me, so I also love you. We'll go back to, to the top of seven again. If you remain in me and in my words remain in you, ask for whatever you want and it will be done for you. By this is my Father glorified that you bear much fruit and become my disciples. Now, to some who may not be uh, what, what, what I want to school in, in the word or that's might not be the right that, that, or um, experience a lot of the word of God, uh, you know, you might see that the words anything, uh, ask for anything you want and it'll be done for you. It's not like you go out there and say, Lord, I want a Cadillac. Boom. That, that's not what it means. Okay. Lord, I want a million dollars. Boom. That's not what it means. We have to, to be within the will of God. Okay. So when we pray, remaining in him and his word in us, what that's telling you, what it's telling me is that we're praying inside the will of God. We're not praying for something whacked out, you know, that has nothing to do with God's will. Okay? Now, see, you can't pray for something whacked out, okay? But it just doesn't work that way. Okay? Um, so, if I'm praying within the will of God, if, if, if he remains in me, if his word remains in me, and I remain in him, then the things I pray for, the things I'm going to do, will walk inside the will of God. Does that make sense? I hope it does. Um, so with that being said, and we invoke the name of Jesus, because other places in Scripture, he says, whatever you ask in my name, the Father will grant you. And again, you got to understand that we're praying within the will of God here, okay? My glass keeps sliding, my greasy nose. But we're praying within the will of God, in, in the, the will that he has for us. Amen? Amen. Um, so when, when we are in communion with Jesus, we're in communion with the Holy Spirit, we're in communion with the Father, okay? He will give us the wisdom on how to pray. And even times when you don't know what to say, sometimes you just sit in your silence and say, Lord, save me. Lord, I know not what to pray. You know the desires of my heart, Father. I pray that you, that you will be with me, Lord God. You hear the desires of my heart. Even though I can't speak them orally, I don't know what to say. I pray, Lord God, that you hear my prayer. 
and you grant the desires of my heart in your will. If you pray in the spirit and you have the gift of tongues, okay, that is another way that when we don't know what to pray, the spirit gives us that gift. So that when we pray in tongues, the desires of our heart comes out to the Holy Spirit in that. And everyone who has a gift of tongues has their own prayer language, of course. Okay? Uh, so whatever I would sound I would make at this point, you know, if I did it for you now, uh, I don't want to be just like an uh, uh, example kind of thing, you know, because it would it, be, to me, just, just, just not true. Um, but if you have the gift of praying in tongues, when you do that, and your spirit knows the desires of your heart, the enemy doesn't even know what you're saying. So even if you know what you want to pray, and you have the gift of tongues, and you pray in tongues, the enemy does not know what you're saying. How cool is that? With that being said, I want to um, give something else real quick. Um, that uh, Let me pull up the unity prayer. That everything we do here tonight, Lord God, that the enemy sees nothing. That you blind the enemy here and now. You blind all of his minions and all of his demons. Anyone who, any part of the, the realm of darkness, Lord God, and all those principalities. That you blind their eyes, you deafen their ears. So they know not anything that we're saying, anything that we're praying, Lord God. That you protect us from all attacks of the enemy. We pray this unity prayer with you. Uh, just I'll speak it out word by line by line, and you can pray it back with me. My adorable Jesus, may our feet journey together. Feet journey together. May our hands gather in unity. Our hands gather in unison. May our hearts beat in unison. May our souls be in harmony. May our thoughts be as one. May our ears listen to the silence together. May our glances profoundly penetrate each other. May our glances, oh, I just said that, I'm sorry. May our lips pray together to gain mercy from the Eternal Father. Amen. Lord, blind enemy to all we're doing here tonight, in Jesus' name. So, so back to the scripture. Um, so that, that piece of John right there, kind of, not kind of, it lets us know that when we walk in unison, in communion with God, with Jesus, with the Holy Spirit, and we pray within God's will that he hears our prayer and he will answer our prayers. It may not look, taste, or feel like we think it's going to be, but he will do it always like we need it. Amen? Amen. Um, to jump from John to, to Haggai, this is another one kind of beat to death a little bit. Um, but, uh, you know, going with things that are happening today, um, oh, I got the right scripture here, I'm in the wrong place. I have so many markers, here we go. Um, and again, I've been through this already, but I'm gonna go through it again, and we're gonna move on with some other things. We kind of want to just kind of refresh your memory, your memory on this. Um, Haggai chapter one, where, the prophet Haggai was being told by God things to relay to the rulers of that day, to the people of that day. The ruler of the, the area at that point was a man named Zerubbabel. Um, what was happening was God had given them a project to rebuild the temple. Okay, and the people got lazy. They started laying back, just worried about themselves, worried about their own ministries, their own this, their own that, their own homes, their own families, but not doing God's project. At the time, his project was build my temple. And they were not doing that. So through the prophet Haggai, God tells them, Thus says the Lord of hosts, This people says, Not now has the time come to rebuild the house of the Lord. Kind of like in our day today. You know, a lot of things that happen in our lives, in our churches, you know, that, man, we don't want to speak out, you know, against things that's not uh, politically correct. And God says, speak out. Not so that you can beat your brother and sister to death, you know, with any kind of sinfulness, okay? But speak out. Because the sin of omission, the times we don't remind people, this is what God says, is every bit as damaging than the sin of commission, if that makes any sense. 
Then the word of God came through Haggai the prophet. It is time for you to dwell in your own panel houses while this house lies in ruins. Now thus says the Lord, consider your ways. What he was saying was, so you're saying it's not time to build my project, to build my temple. But it's okay to do your stuff. It's okay to do your own thing. But my house lies in ruins. Consider your ways. In other words, look at what you're doing. Consider your ways. Consider that I'm giving you instruction and you're complete, you're completely being disobedient. Being oh disobedient. <laughs> being disobedient. God was giving instructions and the people were not listening. Kind of like today. You know, a lot, a lot of times we as humans, myself included, we get too tired, we get too whatever, we get too drug out, we get too strained, we get too stressed, and we tend to just want to do what we want to do. God wants us to listen, to be obedient, to build his project. So what happened, I'm kind of paraphrase, is that things started crumbling around the people. The economy crashed, the crops failed. Things started happening around them where things just wasn't going like they would normally go, and the people were in a lot of pain. Physically, spiritually, emotionally, the whole nine yards. Sounds like a lot like today. What happened was that God spoke to Haggai, the prophet Haggai, and he relayed these messages to the people and to the leaders, to Zerubbabel and the other leaders. And what happened? Those leaders got with the people and they called a fast and they called days of prayer. And they, they told the people to humbly implore the Lord's forgiveness. And the leaders got the people together and made this happen. And God was listening. God was watching. And he saw the repentant nature of the people and the repentant nature of the leaders. And there was a lot of people that was against them. But they stood in the gap. They stood in the gap and they prayed humbly in repentance for their nation, for their community. And God heard their prayers and relented. It goes on to say that God, uh, through the prophet Haggai, uh, was telling them that, you know, as, as he made a pact with them in Egypt, that his spirit continues with them in their midst that day. He says, do not fear. But he goes on to say, for thus says the Lord God of hosts, one moment yet a little while, and I will shake the heavens and the earth, the sea and the dry land. I will shake the nations and the treasures of all the nations will come in. And I will fill this house with glory, says the Lord of hosts. Mine is the silver, mine is the gold, says the Lord of hosts. What he was saying is, I'm going to shake it up. I'm going to shake to the foundation, the heavens and the earth. And you're so worried about your money, you're so worried about your gold and your houses, they're all mine. I gave them to you. And what's going to happen when I shake this earth up? That all those things are going to come back to me. Because when people get frightened, when people get uh, afraid, the first thing we do is call out to God. And God says, when things get shaken up, you're going to come back to me. You'll bring back your time, your talent, your treasures, you'll build my house and it'll be glorified even more this second time around than it was the first time. Again, paraphrasing, okay? So with that, Zerubbabel got the people together, the community together. He started to build that project. He started doing God's project, building his temple. God relented. God had mercy. And he started filling their lives with good things, success, economics, food, riches, peace, harmony, once again. And he goes on to say, Greater will be the future glory of this house than the former, says the Lord of hosts. And in this place, I will give you peace, says the Lord of hosts. Because the people repented, because they stood in the gap with those who wouldn't, the Lord relented. He gave them mercy. He brought back success. Amen. Amen. Some other examples of standing in the gap about being a dangerous prayer warrior. And again, about being a dangerous prayer warrior, which we need today. We need people who are prayer warriors who are dangerous. Who when you pray, the gates of hell shake. Because we are relying on the power of God to fill us with the words, with the prayers, with the sounds, with the sights of everything that we need to bring those in our past into a place of repentance. So God will hear our prayers. 
and he will shake the gates of hell. He will shake us back to an awakening of what it is we have to do to get back on track. Not just our nation as the world, but our nation as the church first. Because we are being shaken as the church to come back to him, to pray in repentance so that he understands, that God understands, that we understand that we need him. Amen? Amen. And a lot of saying is relative. A lot of us saying is repetitive, bro. Okay? But I have to say it over and over to make sure that we understand where we are. So a couple of other examples, okay? Uh, where people stood in the gap, where it looked really, really bad. In the book of Numbers in the Old Testament, by number 17, let me get that up. What was happening here uh, was this is in the days of, of, of Moses, okay? Uh, what was happening was the Levites, who were the priests and what have you in the, the order of things with the 12, 12, tribes, of, 12 tribes of Israel, uh, they were having a lot of, uh, of strife within their ranks, okay? Because God was calling Moses and Aaron to approach the altar of God in the, the, the meeting tent. Okay, this is way back in the day, you know, with the Red Sea and stuff like that, where, where things were just, um, like, God dealing directly with the people prior to Jesus' coming. And God would give them specific instructions, who can approach the tent, who can approach the altar, who can make sacrifice, so on and so forth, okay? And a lot of the, the people in that tribe were getting mad at, Mar at Aaron and Moses because they thought God would show them too much favor. You know, like, well, if we if we the people who are supposed to be the, the, the priest, why he's not letting us uh, do the things he's letting y'all do? Kind of kind of a jealousy thing. There's those exact words, of course, paraphrasing, but you follow what I'm saying. There was a lot of jealousy happening. Um, <clears throat> so what happened, God told Aaron to Moses, you know what? And again, paraphrasing, you know what? Guess what's going to happen? Y'all move away from these people. I'm going to wipe everybody out. I'm sick of it. So y'all get out of the way. I'm going to take care of it. So what happens Moses and Aaron lay praying, prostrating their faces, praying for the mercy of God. They stood in the gap, and God relented. And basically, what ended up happening, God says, I'll tell you what. Instead of taking everybody out, those who are the, the people who are causing the trouble, bring those people to me. So Moses and Aaron got those people together. They came out, uh, and at first they, they were kind of like arguing with Aaron and Moses. They didn't want to come out. You know, then they, they said, no, come to the, to, the, to, the, to the meeting tent, okay? And, you know, God's going to deal with us. So they go out there, and short story, uh, the long story short, which I can't never do. What ends up happening is, uh, God says once again, uh, that he's going to you know, wipe out this smaller group of people. And Aaron and Moses, again, get on their faces praying. And God says, okay. They stood in the gap again. And God says, okay. Those who are specifically causing these problems, I'll deal with them. What ends up happening is those people ended up dying. You have to read the, the book of Numbers to get the details. I don't have a lot of time for the details. But at that point, the people were like terrified because they saw when Moses, basically what happened was Moses said, okay, all of you people who have been causing trouble, y'all come right here together. And it came together. And Moses said, so that you know God is dealing with you and not me, if these people die of normal circumstances like every other human does, then it's not me. If the earth swallows them up, you know it's God. Boom, like that. The earth swallowed them up. How freaky is that? The power of God. So the other people who saw this, they were like, man, they were like afraid. So everybody cleared out. But then the next couple of days, they came back and they started grumbling against Moses and Aaron again. And what was happening was the people, like today, Okay, like our nation, so divided 
that so many people hate our president so much. And I thoroughly, absolutely believe that God has anointed him for the position he's in right now. Whatever you think about him, you think about his past. Okay, God anointed him to do a job he's doing now. To help lead us in the right direction. He won't be the person to save us. He'll be the person anointed by God to help lead us in the right direction. But what happened then was Aaron and Moses went back to God. And God said, all these people who you've been praying for, who you've been standing in the gap for, to keep on fussing, to keep on aggravating you, to keep on complaining, blah, blah, blah. Okay, I'm getting paraphrasing. Okay, I've had it. Okay, so now's the time I need to send a plague among them. And so Aaron and, and Moses again started to pray, okay? But at that moment, this plague broke out amongst the people. And people started dying. Boom, boom, boom. So Moses told Aaron, grab a censer. Basically, those things that we get in church with the, with the incense and stuff, that's the short uh, description of it. Grab a censer with incense, burn it, Run among the people with this incense and this censer. And while we're praying for God to have mercy, we're standing in the gap. So Aaron runs out of his tent at the instruction of Moses with the power of God in his hands. And as he ran through the people, people were dying. The scripture says over 14,000 people died because they were being obstinate and disobedient to God. And against the leaders that God appointed. But as scripture says that as Aaron went through the crowd with this censer, with the incense, praying the whole time he's doing it, that God relented. He stopped the plague. That immediately people stopped dying. Because he stood in the gap. Because dangerous prayer warriors stood in the gap. Amen. Amen. Um, we move to, to, to Acts, to Acts 12. This was Peter in prison. Um, Peter was, uh, there's so many things I want to say. And anyway, Peter, I'm just to you Peter in prison instead of leading up to it because we run a short time. My clock's 20 minutes ahead, like I always say. Uh, so anyway, Peter's in prison, okay? And what's happening is that the scripture tells us that while Peter's in prison, that the church, the people of God in a day, were praying for him. They were standing in the gap. That for whatever reason was Peter's in prison at this time, I'm sorry I talk so fast. Whatever reason Peter was in prison, he was in chains in prison. And they were looking to, to, to torture him and, and keep him in prison for a long time. But scripture says, that the church was outside praying. This is Acts 12. Oop, I went too far. Acts 12, 14 through, I'm sorry, 4 through 11. It goes kind of quick. So this is talking about uh, Herod who had him put in jail. I'm talking about Peter. He says, he had him taken into custody and put in prison under the guard of four squads of four soldiers each. He intended to bring him before the people after Passover. Peter thus was being kept in prison, but prayer by the church was fervently being made to God on his behalf. They were standing in the gap. The people of God were standing in the gap, praying fervently, humbly, fervently, with power, dangerous prayer war. Dangerous prayer warriors with a sword of spirit in their hands doing battle on their knees. Amen, amen. On the very night before Herod was to bring him to trial, Peter, secured by double chains, was sleeping between two soldiers. While outside the door, guards kept watch on the prison. Suddenly, the angel of the Lord stood by him and a light shone in the cell. He tapped Peter on the side. He shook him. He shook him and awakened him, saying, Get up quickly. The chains fell from his wrists. The angel said to him, Put on your belt and your sandals. He did so. Peter did so. Then he said to him, Put on your cloak and follow me. So he followed him out, not realizing that what was happening through the angel was real, because he thought he was seeing it in a vision. 
They passed the first guard, then the second, and then came to the iron gate leading out to the city, which opened for them itself. The gate opened by itself, by the power of God. Because prayer warriors, dangerous prayer warriors were interceding. And the power of God was at work. They emerged and made their way down the alley, and suddenly the angel left him. Then Peter recovered his senses and said, Now I know for certain that the Lord sent this angel and rescued me from the hand of Herod and from all that the Jewish people had not been expecting. There's a lot more to that. The dangerous prayer intercessors, people wielding the sword of the Spirit in prayer, in faith, fervently praying, stood in the gap for Peter. And God answered their prayers. Amen. So we're going to Acts 16 now. <clears throat> Acts 16, this is Paul and Silas were in prison. What had happened was that there was a woman uh, who was basically a, a soothsayer, basically a fortune teller, okay, who was um, doing things for, for people in the town to make them rich. She's making them a lot of money. What was happening, she's like the insider trader person, you know, that, if that makes any kind of sense. She was giving them answers to things through fortune telling that was helping them make money, which is not done by the power of God, which is done through soothsaying, fortune telling, divining, things like that, okay? So what was happening was Paul and Silas was walking through the town and this woman would come up behind him and say, they are with God. These people have the power of God with them. Now, at some point you say, man, that's pretty cool. You should recognize that. But what was happening was, the, excuse me, the enemy was getting her to scream this out so people would be afraid of them, okay, and not listen to them. Because they were trying to get people to do the right thing and turn from the ways like this diviner, this, this sorceress, whatever you want, excuse me, whatever you want to call this woman, okay? And at some point, Paul and Silas are going through the town, and she keeps on, keeps on, keeps on, keeps on. And it says that Paul became annoyed, turned, and said to the spirit, the spirit inside the woman, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And it says the spirit came out of her in an instant. When her owners saw that their hope of profit was gone, they seized Paul and Silas and dragged him to the public square before the local authorities. Basically, in the thorn in prison, chaining them up, okay, after beating them with, with rods. And so they took their cloaks off and, and beat them with, with, with rods and, and whips and stuff. Uh, threw them in prison. But check this out. Dangerous prayer warriors. Even though they were beaten and put in prison, they kept giving God glory. Scripture says that they were singing and praying in their prison cells, Paul and Silas, after being beaten and in prison. They were singing and praying in their prison cells to where everyone in the prison heard was going on. And it says that during the night, that an earthquake shook the foundation of the prison. I heard another preacher, a prophet, say, talking about this, this scripture passage. And it says, as Paul and Silas were singing, and praising God in their imprisonment. He says, I could just see it. They're singing and they're giving God glory. And God's in heaven. And he's, he's just enjoying that his children, even though they're in trouble in prison, they're giving him praise. And God starts tapping his foot. And when he does, when he taps his foot, he shakes the foundation of the prison. Boom. How cool is that? Now, whether that's exactly what happened or not, we don't know. But just it gives you a good visual so it goes on to say, let's see, make sure I get to the, to the correct one is fast enough for you. Uh, I think I want to start at, um, let me start at here. So it says that there was suddenly such a severe earthquake that the foundation of the jail shook. All the doors flew open and the chains of all were pulled loose. All the prisoners, not just Paul and Silas. It says, when a jailer woke up and saw the prison doors wide open, he drew his sword and was about to kill himself because back then if they lost a prisoner, they were, they were killed. They were put to death. But Paul shouted in a loud voice, do not harm yourself, we're all here. Because even though they were loose, they didn't run. Anyway, scripture goes on to say that um, 
they ended up escaping. Okay, and making making a, a, a clear one. But with the, the point of this is, is that dangerous prayer warriors sought the power of God with humble, expected hope, and God rocked their world because they were dangerous prayer warriors. They prayed in faith, they prayed in trust, they prayed in truth. Amen, amen. So now I'm going to jump down to, to Hebrews 12. Hebrews 12. <clears throat> this is um, starting at 26. Let me, let me maybe go, let me go 25. We'll start at 25 instead. Hebrews 25. Again, we're talking about uh, dangerous prayer warriors and what God does with the prayers of his people. See that you do not reject the one who speaks. For if they did not escape when they refused the one who warned them on earth, how much more in our case if we turn away from the one who warns them from heaven? In other words, what that's telling us is that, you know, if while Jesus was on the earth, people didn't listen to him then, God, Jesus, Holy Spirit, three persons in one God. If people didn't listen to the Son of God when he was on earth, how much more would they not listen to a God in heaven that they can't see? So it goes on to say, His voice shook the earth at that time, but now he has promised, I will once more shake not only earth, but heaven. That phrase, once more, points to the removal of shaken, created things, so that what is unshaken may remain. Therefore, we who are receiving the unshakable kingdom should have gratitude with which she should wish we should offer worship pleasing to God in reference, in reverence and awe. For God, for our God is a consuming fire. The shaking awakening that we're going through right now, this should rattle the church to our core. So that we come to a repentance, not only for ourselves, but for our nation and for our world. But we'll start first with our nation. Because God's building project right now is to get the United States back on our feet. Because we are the beacon of light and liberty and freedom in the world. Do we have problems? Absolutely. Do we have issues in our political, in our uh Political scene, absolutely. But if we didn't have any sin, if we didn't have any problems, Jesus wouldn't have had to die on the cross. But God knew that we knuckleheaded children, and he did it himself because he knew that in our humanness we couldn't do it ourselves. But what he's asking us to do is to be faithful, to be trusting, and to understand that he has the power to give us everlasting life and to give us everything that we need to sustain ourselves here on earth and through eternity. He wants us to humbly extend ourselves to him to humbly pray, to be dangerous prayer warriors that we speak his word, that we allow him, his word, his light, his truth to come through us to help us in our journeys to him. His power, his mercy, his light dispels the darkness. We have to know that that's the truth. We have to know that he will not abandon us. That even as the world tries to destroy us, the world, oh, I think we had a glitch just now, that even as the world tries to destroy our country, our nation, our people, that God wants us to look to him, that God wants us to pray to him for mercy, for salvation, because only he can make this happen. 
He is the vine, we are the branches. Jesus says, I'm the vine, you are the branches, my Father is the vine grower. And one cool thing about something you see through Jesus throughout Scripture is that Jesus never takes credit for things himself. He always refers us to the Father. Just like Jesus' mother Mary. Mother Mary never takes anything credit for herself. She always points us toward Jesus. With the miracles he did, or the miracle he did at the wedding in Cana, he tells the waiter, do whatever he says. Anytime that scripture speaks of Mary, she's pointing us toward Jesus. Lord, I pray that you're with us here. I pray, God, that you're strengthening our hearts. I pray that, that you are giving us everything that we need, Lord God, to not only endure this time of trial that we're in right now, but that when we come through this, Lord God, that we are a stronger, more faithful church, and that we will give you ourselves open and empty vessels to use as you will. I pray, Lord God, that any prayer requests that, that have been put here on these replies, these comments, any prayer requests in the hearts of those listening and watching, either now live or later recorded, I feel like, God, that you're working in our lives right now to give us the desires of our hearts to answer those prayers being spoken, being typed, being silently kept in our hearts. That you give us health, that you give us prosperity, Lord God, that you give us longevity, endurance, and give us faith, Father. In Scripture, when people didn't have faith, you, through the Word of God, explain to them, pray for faith. Lord, give me faith. There are times in Scripture where Jesus rebukes his, his apostles, his apostles for things, and he says, "You of little faith, be not afraid. Have the faith. If you had the faith the size of a mustard seed, you could move mountains." Lord God, we know you're moving mountains for us today. You know you're moving mountains right now, Lord God, with this disease, with things happening in the world. Because we know, Lord God, that you are on our side and we know that, that you want us to be prosperous in you. Maybe not the way the world sees prosperity or success, but God knows what success means for each and every one of us in, through, and with him. Hopefully that makes sense to you. Um, just know that what's happening in the world today the shaking that's hopefully awakening us, awakening the church to become the dangerous prayer warrior we need to be, to shut the enemy down, to be the light in the darkness, that our nation is the light in the darkness to the world, regardless of the problems we have. God wants us to help him build his project. He wants our leaders our president, our governor, our mayors, everyone, to look to him for our salvation, not just eternally, but here on earth as well. He wants us to allow him into every decision we make. I know it sounds crazy at times, but it's the truth. And I've seen things that God has done in my life, in the life of those around me, that just blow my mind. And I've seen what being a dangerous prayer warrior can do. I've seen what faith and trust in God can do when my back was at the Red Sea. A lot of you know my story with that. We'll do more of that later. But I've seen more times in the last five years of things happening when people were down and out, when the... the the last thing that they were told was, this is it. Whatever the situation was, this is it. Nothing else can be done. And I've seen God bring life from death. I've seen him bring success from poverty. I've seen him bring broken people into the light. Hurting people. That just thought there was no more hope. That when they gave themselves to God, when they opened themselves to Jesus Christ and the power of the Holy Spirit, he rocked their world. He made something of lives that they thought was lost. If God is on our side, who can be against us? 
That is all my son. You should not be afraid. Amen. God is on our side. God is on our side. We won't be afraid. Though the mountains may fall and the sky will crumble, and nothing's gonna stand in our way. Everyone around the world will become a deep and joyful sound. See the heavens open up, we hear the music coming down. Nothing's gonna separate us from the Father's love. I can't come but celebrate. God is on our side. Then be against us. God is on our side. We won't be afraid. Though the mountains may fall and the sky will crumble, and nothing's gonna stand in our way. Come on down to the riverside, wash it all the way. Leave behind your troubled mind for a cloudy day. Nothing gonna separate us from the Father's love. I can't help but celebrate, cause we're not alone. God is on our side. We can be against us. God is on our side. We won't be afraid. Though the mountains be fall in the sky, trouble and nothing gonna stand in our way. Amen. <coughs> One more thing. I want you to help me pray for a young man and his family in a village in India. I'm going to say the, I'm going to probably pronounce his name wrong because I've, I've been in contact with him a lot over the last month, uh, you know, by uh, texting and, and uh, messenger and stuff. I think he would pronounce it Naresh Pillam. Naresh, if that's not how you pronounce your name properly, I'm so sorry, my brother. But I want y'all to pray for him, his family, and their village. They're having a really hard time right now in India. Uh, and if anybody's interested in trying to help, that they would like to help them in any kind of way, uh, drop me a line. You know, send me a text, drop me a message or something, and we'll uh, kind of help uh, see if we can do some more things for their, their, their family and their village there. But anyway, thank y'all again for tuning in. Uh, if y'all get a, a second, check out my dear friend, uh, Pastor Terry Lobel, the Pastor T. Uh, Terry Lobel is Terry Pastor T Lobel on Facebook. Uh, they're doing a, um, a live shot uh, in about five minutes from now, uh, a little uh, old time revival kind of kind of church meeting. But uh, anyway, give it a shot. Peace in Christ, y'all. I love you, and uh, be that dangerous prayer warrior. Be that dangerous prayer warrior. Let God open your heart and show you how to wield that sword of the Spirit. Amen. Amen. Peace in Christ, y'all. Good night.